I'm here with David Brooks of the New York Times, who's written a fascinating new book called The Social Animal. Welcome, David. Good to be with you, John. Um, I, th this book is about the mind and our behavior, and it ch challenges a lot of our notions about the world that we grew, grew up with, these things yeah. we believe. And I want to start with a sentence you have in the introduction, which is that y you say in, your, in writing this book um, and in researching these ideas that you are, are removing or that we should not think about the conscious mind as having a privileged place in the center of our human behavior. That yeah. seems like a pretty radical idea. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so we all have a voice in our head that, and we think it's telling us how to act. But in, in actuality, we're acting in ways that we don't quite understand the reasoning behind. And most of our thinking is happening be below the level of awareness. So for example, some of our are simple and trivial that I like. So people named Dennis are disproportionately likely to become dentists. And people named Lawrence become lawyers because unconsciously we're biased toward things we're familiar. Or if you look at who gets married to who, people marry people with similar nose widths, with similar eyes, similar distance apart, with complementary immune systems. And they're not thinking about that. We don't think about immune systems. But we're biased by all the information that's flowing through us. And sometimes in trivial ways, but sometimes in profound ways. How do we relate to other people? How do we see ourselves? Do we have a good ability to scan the environment to pick out patterns? All those things are really important, and they're happening below our conscious mind. And you write about the, the one of the great uh, images you pr you offer for this is the brain. Basically, it's operating, doing its thing, and that yeah. the brain's ability to create connections and process is like imagining a football stadium filled with spaghetti yeah. and shrinking that down into your head, and that represents the wiring in our heads that's working at this level you're talking about. Right, so there, the, the mind can take in about 12 million pieces of information a minute of which, of which it can be conscious of 40. So all the rest is just going on down there and some of it is incredibly subtle and, and, and quite uh, better than what we can do consciously. So for example, one of the most cognitively difficult things we do is buy furniture. It's really hard to go in a furniture store and figure out what a sofa is going to look like in your house. And so somebody did a study, how should you make that decision? One of the things you should do is just marinate with the, with the sofa. Don't write down a list of pros and cons consciously. Then take a shower, take a nap, relax, and then go with your gut. And unconsciously, that kind of decision. And so what you're talking about here is learning to use the conscious brain to ride this data, ride and harness all of this right. incredible stuff that's coming in. What are some other ways in which uh, people can think about that or in which we uh, should kind of throw out our old thinking about, you know, uh, as you say, making a list of all the couches and mm -hmm. we think when we're doing that that we're, we're really using our brain, you yeah. know, the pros and the cons and it's all very right. orderly. But that's... Uh, uh, well, that's partly what you do and one of the things you're doing when you're making that list is sort of you're getting the conscious mind, unconscious mind to think about it. But then don't forget that there's another way of understanding reality. So a couple things you can do very practically. Say you're dating someone. One of the things they suggest is startle them. Because when you startle someone, <laughs> if they react with anger, then you can tell something about their underlying temperament. If they act with surprise and then they laugh, you can tell something else. And what they call the startle response is a very powerful way. Uh, another thing we do is we, we rely right now too much on email. Uh, and communicate electronically. So there's one research where they took a bunch of people who were face to face and they had them solve a math problem. They gave them 10 minutes to do it and they could do it quite well. Then they took another group, gave them 30 minutes to do it, but made them communicate it by email and they could not do it. Those groups broke apart. So communicating face to face is just a much better way. And even in the workplace, if you really want to get your team to perform well, don't reward individuals for results, reward a team for results because then everybody's working together and that compensation system actually works better. Let's talk ab about politics here, which is what you normally write about, and there's quite a lot of that in this book. Uh, I love the section in which you talk about presidential campaigns and politics. How does this apply, this way of thinking about the way we think, how does it apply to the way we pick candidates? I mean, mm -hmm. how much of it is, as you say in the book, uh, those of us in the business sometimes yeah. like to think it's a list of policy prescriptions, yeah. but it's not, is it? Right, no, so we cover, well, we sometimes in our newspapers or online, we will say, okay, here's this health care plan and this health care plan. You can choose the candidate with the right health care plan. I've never met a human being who voted on that basis. What we do is we find out who's like us, who reacts like us. And some of those, those de decisions we make are incredibly quick. So there's a piece of research where they took people and gave them faces of opposing candidates in races they knew nothing about and said, who strikes you as more competent? And by asking that question, giving people a one second glimpse of the faces, they could predict with 70% accuracy who was gonna win that election. And then another experiment, they gave people 
people running for governor in, in faraway states, and they showed them videos of the two candidates. Uh, and with the sound on, they did an okay job of predicting who would win. With the sound off, they did a phenomenally good job of predicting, so without the words. And so a lot of that is we're doing, you know, this is what we do in life. We, we're evaluating people, evaluating our dentist, our plumber, anybody else. And so we use those skills, which are quite well honed, to evaluate candidates. So that's the emotional stuff along with the conscious stuff, which is also important. They're both important. As a president, Barack Obama has occasionally been knocked for um, lacking the emotional piece of the presidency, uh, whether it was the BP oil spill or even with Libya. People have said, you know, he should do something. And right. there's some uh, empty hole there of action that he is not filling. Is that yeah. a part of what you're talking about in terms of the way we evaluate our, our candidates and presidents? Right. I, I do think it is. You know, you don't have to be gregarious to be social. You can read a book and you're engaging another human being. But sometimes in our politicians, we want to be able to see the emotion, to know that they're reacting the way we would react. And some people are just more vibrant, like Bill Clinton. You could sort of read him. Uh, President Obama has, uh, I think he's less, less trusting of the audience, and so he doesn't just lay himself out and say, I'm going to react this way, catch me. Uh, and I, my own psychobabble explanation is that he's a person with many different selves. And one of the things the research emphasizes, we're not just one person. We have many different selves which are aroused by different circumstance. And I think he has so many different personalities in there. One personality is already always looking at another. And that gives him a, a measure of caution all the time. As a final question I want to ask you, in the work that you do now, or even in just your day to day, mm -hmm. do you find yourself uh, uh, following a slightly different map of the way you look at yeah. just the smallest little things to say, here's what I would have thought when I had this one right. understanding of my brain chemistry. Here's how I think about yeah, it now. So I now see everything psychologically, whether it's the emotional tide sweeping through Egypt and Tunisia, I see that more as a psychological process. Or the financial crisis, I see that as mass irrationality and psychology. And then I focus more on the relationships between people and less on individual decision makers. And just personally, in the way I raise my kids and stuff like that, uh, I think I'm more aware of emotions and the, the ripples of emotions. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm great at expressing it. I'm not like a naturally emotive sort of person. Uh, and yet, so it, that's something I still have to work on. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly more aware of this stuff than I used to be. All right, David Brooks, the book is The Social Animal. Thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, thank you. Pleasure.